So for our last speaker, um, that gives you a little bit of context. Um, I get to do some really cool things. I can meet some really, really interesting people. And I didn't see this one coming. So we did the Squattober, and um, we, we installed the gym. And Ricky called me. He's like, dude, you got to get out of here. I was like, what? He's like, this place is, is incredible. It, it's like, and I'll let Sean give you some context. But I went out, and I said, oh, I, want, I want to see it. I want to talk to these, these gentlemen. And I talked to Sean, and, and I couldn't get enough. And, I, and we talked, and we talked, and we talked. And he was just giving me all this insight and, and of the whole situation there. And, and, of course, like I generally do, maybe I try to get digging rights too quickly. I was like, will you speak at Summer Strong? <laughs> And he, like most people would say, I don't know what that is, but maybe. <laughs> and uh, so that was nine months ago. Uh, so I'd been very, very um, excited to have uh, the rest of our conversation uh, finish. And hopefully you guys get to hear it. Sean Martin. Before I start, I want to give a, um, a form of respect, uh, an acknowledgement to the original inhabitants of this land, this place that Sorenix calls home. So to my Muscogee and my Yamasei brothers and sisters, those relatives, I appreciate you. I love you wherever you are, however you live now. Yat eh. Ya a eh. Oh, yat eh. That's the ne that's a Navajo word for hello, but it means much more than just hi, hello. It means everything is good in this place. Below us, above us, around us, and between you and I, as people, everything is good. Yaat eh. That's how we greet one another in my culture. She ya Sean Martin Yinish ye. Beish bichai the net in the shlin. Do hon honagatni. I should nell her. Let me go back. She ya Sean Martin Yinish ye. Beish bichai the net in the shlin. Sit not jinny, bushes chin, beish bichai dasha chero honoratni, asha nala. All of that means hello again. I'm just kidding. <laughs> you know, and when you watch a western with John Wayne and there's the native talking, and then all of a sudden it's just like one word. <laughs> Hi. No, what I did was I introduced myself traditionally to you. That's who I am. Sha'aya, my name is, the creator knows me as. People call me Sean Martin. And when I say people, I don't mean just you, human beings, five-fingered people. I mean all people, the wind people, the elemental people, the land people, the bird people, the insect people, the rock people, the iron people. Everything is a person in our life way, our view. Ina, the way we live our life, the life way. We believe everything's a person. So when I introduce myself to anything, to any person, I start with my four clans. Sha'aya Sean Martin. My name is Sean Martin. Beshbajai the net and the Metal hat people clan is who I'm born, who I am. The Navajo culture is a matriarchal culture. Very different from Western philosophy of life, right? In our family, everything is owned and is run and is processed through the mom, the female. The female gives us life. The female is who I am. I am my mother's clan, the metal hat people. Next, I am born for my father's clan. Sitna Jini Bashishchin, 
The black streak in the wood people is who I am born for, my father. And that's paying homage to my father's mother, right? Because my father is, he is his mother's clan. And then I say my maternal grandfather's name or his clan because he is his mother's clan. So I say, my grandfather on my maternal side. And then I say, the ones who walk around clan is my paternal grandfather because that's who his grandmother was or who his mother was. So in this way, I immediately establish kinship with any person that I ever come in contact with in our Navajo culture. I can meet a Navajo person that I've never met from the other side of the reservation, and if he has one of my four clans, he's either my brother, my father, my grandfather, or he could be my son, depending on which clan he is and how we're related. I could meet the 60-year-old man, and he could be my son, and I, or little brother, and he, ha- he would have to acknowledge me as his older brother. It establishes kinship. And it goes back to the days of survival when there was little. There was nothing around. And when somebody wandered into your home, your homestead, you establish kinship. Yat, eh, everything is good here between you and I. Oh, let's hear your clans. Oh, you know what? You're my brother. You're my grandfather. Come in, grandfather. I've never met you before, but this is your home now too. Sit down. Let's have a meal. Let's talk. How are you doing? What do you need? We're family. This is my life way. I taught for almost 10 years at Chinle High School and coached cross country and track and field. I then went to Diné College, our local tribal college, where I was the athletic director and track and field cross-country coach for two years. I could care less about the accolades, the titles, the All-Americans. What matters to me most is we had 49 kids from Chin Lee go to college on running scholarship. And um, every time I conducted the start of a class, at the, at the doorway of our weight room, I used to teach the strength and conditioning class. At the doorway, I did just like my grandfather did. He stood at the doorway of our hogan, a traditional Navajo home. When somebody comes to visit you, you go out to greet them. You don't sit on your couch and let them come to the door and say, come in. You go out there and you greet them. You greet them with that handshake. So every single hour of every single day for 10 years, I would go out in front of the door to the weight room and welcome every student in by saying, yat eh. Little brother, little sister, you're welcome here. And then we would get to work. But before we got to work, we established good things. We would share good things to start the day. The class, the practice, whatever the session was, we started by sharing good things. So I want to do that today. My good thing is that just two weeks ago, our track and field team won for the first time in 20 years our regional championships. The girls won it and the boys won it. That is a very good thing. But there's a lot of good things to celebrate. There's a lot of good things and we forget that sometimes. So I want three more people to share one good thing that's happened in the last 24 hours. Just three. Three people. One good thing. Yes. Oh man. First home run. It's a milestone. Did he get to keep the ball? He kept the ball. That's awesome. Nice. Nice. Two more. Yes, sir. Wife just got her green card. Welcome. Welcome. Beautiful. It's amazing. One more. Yes. You got to FaceTime your wife and four kids. Good. Beautiful. You know, growing up and living on the reservation my whole life, I only moved off the res for five years, and that was to go to college. I was a D1 athlete at Northern Arizona University in cross country and track and field, one of the best running programs to this day still. Very humble to be able to have that opportunity. 
but I was only able to do it because I held on to my traditional Navajo teachings and I was forced to understand the idea that holding on to your ancient practices and cultures and beliefs could be a good thing, not a crutch like many Native people use it today, an excuse to drink, an excuse to gangbang, an excuse to leave your family, an excuse. And so I made a conscious effort to use it as a positive, turn an obstacle into an opportunity. There's a lot of trauma in negative people's lives, a lot of historical trauma. But I made a conscious effort to flip that. One of the persons I met, his name was Jason Karp. He's right now in I-10, Kenya, working uh, with some Kenyan runners. He said this. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but what I want to say is at the very end, what you choose is not as important that you choose it and that you pursue it fully. So there's a lot of people here who hate to run. (laughs) There's a lot of people here who love the fish. There's a lot of people who love to hunt. There's a lot of people who love a lot of different things here. Whatever your inspiration is, whatever you choose to do, Jason said to pursue it fully. So I've always stuck by that. I just want to throw this up there real quick. How do you define yourself? We'll come back to that later. How do you define yourself? The why. We talked about why, the why, the why, the why. This is important. Okay. 30 years ago, America was the leader in quality and quantity of high school diplomas. Today, our nation is ranked 36 in the world. A third grade student today who reads at the appropriate reading level compared to a third grade student who does not, is four times more likely to graduate on time. Furthermore, a student living in poverty is 13 times less to graduate on time. Teacher quality is one of the most significant factors related to student achievement. In the U.S., 14% of new teachers resign by the end of the first year, 33 leave within their first three years, and almost 50% leave by their fifth year. We must improve because the consequences of failing to succeed in school have never been more dire. The gap in earnings between college graduates and high school dropouts is the largest in the industrialized world. The gap in life expectancy, we're talking life and death, the gap between life expectancy between college graduates and high school dropouts is one of the largest in the industrialized world and it's growing. Effective teaching and effective schools have never been more important. Why is, why is what we do important? A lot of our kids will never get a chance to learn how to do a deadlift or a squat if they're not at school. In America today, especially with students from poverty, their introduction to a weight room is at school. So where the heck is this guy with this ponytail from? That's right where I'm at, northeastern Arizona. The four corner states, Arizona, Utah, Colorado, New Mexico, the Navajo Reservation encompasses the upper quarter of of the state of Arizona. We have four sacred mountains to the east, to the south, to the west, and to the north of us. And inside those four sacred mountains, is our traditional homeland. That's where we call home. Anywhere inside of that is our home. I have a crazy story. I have a couple crazy stories, but this is one that I want to share that Bert heard when he came out to Chin Lee. My father. I can relate to Bert enormously because the love I see that he has for his father. My father grew up on a very traditional homestead, Navajo homestead just east of the Grand Canyon's rim. He lived a very traditional Navajo lifestyle. Only Navajo was spoken, no English. He lived in a hogan, a traditional Navajo dwelling that's eight-sided, probably 20 feet nominal diameter, dirt floor, no running water, no electricity. It's made out of logs and mud with a fireplace in the center and a chimney that goes out the top. No closure, just a hole about this big and a chimney coming out the top. He had nine siblings. Ten people lived in that dirt floor hogan. Ten kids, both parents and a set of grandparents. Fourteen people in a room 
almost the size of this lifting platform right here. They lived a very traditional lifestyle where silversmithing was a sore, uh, form of income and livestock, cows specifically. So one day, living this traditional lifestyle, they had a jeep, an army jeep, rolled up to the Hogan, to the homestead. Armed soldiers with guns got out of the vehicle, took all 10 kids from the homestead, and left with them. My dad was taken to this place called Loop, Arizona, just east of Flagstaff. At Loop, he was kicked out of the Jeep. He was made to stand in a line in front of this old boarding school. Back then, the boarding school was brand new. My dad was standing in this line, and as he got closer to the front of the line, he realized what was happening. They were taking every native boy that they could round up, strip them down naked, and cut their hair off. Navajo culture, our hair is important. It has the teachings from our elders through stories, through experiences. Everything we live and learn and do is stored in our hair. So our hair is a representation of our experience, our learning, our growth, our progress as a person. We don't let our hair run all crazy because then our thoughts go crazy. We groom it. We take control of it. We organize it. It's the first thing we do. A sign of affection in the Navajo world is somebody taking care of your hair for you. My dad was stripped naked and his clothes were thrown in a pile. Later they were burned with diesel fuel. He got to the front of the line and he didn't want to get his hair cut. So he stepped out of line. Immediately, a guy grabbed him by the back of his head and put him back in line. He fought him. The guy took a hot shot. You know what a hot shot is? A cattle prod, an electrified cattle prod. It has two ends on it, so you hit a, a cow in the butt and it moves. My dad was hit in the back of the neck with a cattle prod, and he got back in line. They cut his hair off. He gave him a bag, got a couple pairs of clothes, and taken to the bunkhouse. There's an educator, it sounds funny, it's not, it's, it's, his name sounds funny, but it's actually his God-given name, Flip Flippin, said that change will only happen if you have a compelling and urgent reason to change. Otherwise, true change will happen. It has to be compelling and urgent. Otherwise, true change won't happen. You know what I realized when my dad was telling me this story when I was about nine years old? This was my dad's first day of school. What was your first day of school like? My first day of school was very different. My dad wanted to make sure my first day of school was not like his first day of school. His first day of school was the U.S. government's promise to educate native kids. It also happened to be the Kill the Indian, Save the Man initiative, where every Native American was round up, taken to a boarding school and colonized, beaten for speaking their native tongue, beaten for practicing any traditional ceremony, abused if they did anything other than learn how to farm or learn how to sew. That was my dad's first day of school. Of course, he hated it. He hated school. He tried to run away one night, so he was nine or ten years old. He had this idea, I'm going to take extra food from the cafeteria each day, and he hid it in his, in his pillow sack. And after he accumulated a little bit of food, one night he ran. It was in the middle of winter. He ran away from the boarding school and into the little Colorado River wash. And he knew that if he stayed in that wash, it would end up at Cameron Trading Post. That was about 40 miles away. And then he knew if he stayed there at Cameron, he knew the way home because that was the closest trading post where they traded goods, right? So this little nine-year-old boy ran out of the bunkhouse in the middle of the night, ran into the riverbed, and stayed in there all night, and he just trotted 
all night until the sun came up. When the sun came up, he dove underneath some bushes and just stayed there. He said he could hear people on horseback and in jeeps yelling his name to try to get him and take him back. But he didn't want to go back. He hated school. So he stayed down. Sun went down, he got up, and he ran all night. After the second night of ran running, he got to Cameron Trading Post, and he slept back in the, in the stables with the horses. He felt comfortable with horses. He felt more at home with the horses than he did at boarding school. Third night of running, he finally got home. This story is important to me because my dad only told it to me once. When I was nine or ten, and I remember that story so vividly because in the Navajo language, it's a very descriptive language. He talked about running from boarding school. He talked about how much it hurt, being in the middle of winter, almost freezing to death, being dehydrated and camping or cramping and not being able to hardly walk. But then he describes the light that he saw on the third night just before sun came up. A light glow of the fireplace out the chimney hole of the Hogan. The smell of the dirt floor when he walked into the Hogan. The smell of the cedar post walls. The smell of his grandmother when she grabbed him and hugged him so tight and cried because they didn't speak English and they didn't know where these soldiers took all ten kids that they hadn't seen for months. The taste of mutton stew and fry bread again. He only told me that one time because he, he wanted it to be impactful. And it's changed my life way. It's changed my view on life. It's changed my purpose. It changed why I wanted to get up and do what I do every day. So he was home for about two weeks after running 83 miles. I went back and charted it. Now that we have all this amazing technology, I went and GPSed it. It's 83 miles from, that home, from, the, from the boarding school, that first route he took back to, back to the homestead. 83 miles, this nine-year-old kid ran over three nights in the middle of winter because he hated school and he wanted to go home. He got taken back about two weeks later, and the same thing happened. He hated school, so he did it once. He was going to do it again. He ran away about five or six more times over the next two or three years. He did it so much that the boarding school finally caught him the last time and brought him back and said, you know what? You're not welcome here anymore. You're a problem child. You will never be successful in a new world. You will never understand the American dream and the American way of life. You're going to be a failure. Leave. You're not even welcome here anymore. So he said, fine, I'm out. Grabbed his stuff and started walking home. Some Mormon missionaries saw this Navajo kid walking on the side of the road and just picked him up and said, hey, do you want to go live with a, a placement foster family in central Utah? He didn't know what the hell a placement program was. He didn't know what a foster family was. He didn't know where central Utah was. He just said, cool, I'm down. They got good food. They took him. No parental consent, nothing. They took him. Dropped him off at a little railroad community in central Utah called Melford. And it wasn't for that Mormon family who let my dad be my dad. He let him be Navajo. Let him get up and run every morning to the east to celebrate, to pray, to learn, and to heal. And they taught him how to be successful in this little Mormon community. They learned from him and he learned from them. He ended up graduating from there. He met my mom. Then he wanted to move back to the reservation to start his family. So that's where my four brothers, that's where my three brothers and I were born. Right back on the reservation. And he did that because he wanted to ensure that he taught us our culture, our language, our Ina, our way of life. So he did that. I lived on a border town or lived in a place called Lechii. Most people know Antelope Canyon, Instagram famous. Most people know Horseshoe Bend, Instagram famous. 
That's my backyard. Antelope Canyon is actually my grandmother's side of the family's name. My uncle's actually buried about 500 feet from Antelope Canyon, and millions of tourists walk underneath my dead uncle every day. When I was a kid, I used to herd cows out of the canyon because they'd go in there to the slot canyon for the shade in the middle of summer, and we'd have to run about five or six miles down there to find the cows and then hike them all the way back up to the home site. That's before Instagram, before it became a thing, before Britney Spears and Kim Kardashian shot videos and took photos in there. That was just a playground. That was our playground. So my dad made sure he raised us correctly. I started school in Page, which is just off of the res. I went to school. Oh, that's my dad. That's what remains of the old boarding school. It was important enough for me to go back to retrace my father's footsteps. I went back and I ran it. I ran more than 83 miles. I took the longest route. It ended up being 103 miles. I ran it in about 20, well, about 18 hours. And I pushed myself. It was filmed for a movie called 3100 Run and Become. You can check it out later if you want. But I ran 103 miles to retrace my father's footsteps in honor of every Navajo kid, every Native American kid who was involuntarily taken to a boarding school in the Kill the Indian and Save the Man initiative. I put myself in a hurt zone to feel what my father felt to understand how kids could perish in the elements, unprotected and uncared for. It was, an, it was a transformative experience. It was amazing. So that's when I went back there. That's my dad and my daughter. That's me when I was four years old. My dad wanted to raise us with our traditional upbringing. And part of being Navajo, running is a large part of our culture. We're taught to wake up every single day and run at first light. As soon as the sun comes up over the horizon, we are asked, we are told, we should be running to the east. Running to the east to greet the sun, to celebrate. Running is a form of celebration. We believe that in the east, the creator lives. And at the birth of a new day, just like when a baby is born, mom is there obviously giving birth, but father is there to welcome the baby to the, to the world. So we believe that Mother Earth and Father Sky, the Creator, all these holy deities that we believe in are out during the birth of a new day to welcome their children into the day. So we run east and we're taught that running itself is a form of celebration, the act of movement. So all the movements you do every day is a form of celebration. You start that by running to the east. You celebrate all the things you've been blessed with and the things you haven't been blessed with, the, the, the positives and the negatives. We believe that there's positive in the world and there's negative in the world. You can't have one without the other. You can't have all good without some bad. You can't have all bad without any good. Hajan is the name that we have for living a balanced life. Hajan. So running is a form of celebration. You celebrate all the good and the bad. Running is a form of prayer. Our footsteps speak to our mother, the earth. Just like when a baby is in the womb, the baby's foot kicks against mama's stomach, right? And mom can feel that. Same thing, we're speaking to our mother. We're telling her, thank you for life, mom. Thank you for your nourishment. We breathe in, Father Sky. Have you ever seen a child born? Instant love, right? When my daughter was born, instant love. I've never met this being in my life, but she came out and instant connection and love. I watched her take her first, first breath. So when I step out of my home every morning, I take in a big breath and I start my run. It's a form of, of prayer. We run and we pray. 
Running in the Navajo culture is also a teacher. It's a mentor. It teaches us how to become a better person when you're fighting the struggle of pain and doubt and emotions and all of those things that are involved when you're in the hurt zone. Running teaches you to overcome those things and become a better person. So it teaches you. Running is a form of celebration, a form of prayer. It's a mentor. It teaches you. Finally, running is medicine. It heals. It heals you. And so when I talk about running, I want you to understand that it's not just running. It's movement. Movement is celebration. Movement is prayer. Movement is learning. Movement is medicine. I think those four things were hit hard this weekend, and I appreciate all the speakers that talked about that. You're more Navajo than you know. So that's what running is in the Navajo culture, and we're taught not just to do it or believe it. We're taught to do it. And we're out there running. We're told to yell out loud. Yell to the creator. When you're running east, you yell. When you feel a connection to the earth, to the sky, to the holy people, the plant people, the animal people, the elemental people, we yell. When we feel that connection, we yell. You know in the Olympics when they're talking to the 10K champion and they said, oh, I felt the energy from the crowd. They really brought me home that last lap. You can feel that same energy from those holy people out there. You feel it. And when you feel that energy, when you draw upon that energy, we're told to yell out loud, to let those people, the creator, know we acknowledge them and we're giving thanks. You yell like a warrior, breathing life into the world, breathing life and giving thanks and celebrating all of it. You yell out loud. Let them know you're out there. This morning I was running and I felt it and I yelled. There was some dude with some groceries on the sidewalk. He's like, oh, sh- are you okay, bro? I'm like, brother, I am good. I am celebrating life today. I think I caught him off guard. (laughs) Anyways, my dad made sure we had this traditional belief of running, of movement. So then I start school at a school just off the reservation at this border town. I get to first grade. I'm in Mrs. Ford's class. I'm the only Navajo kid in that class. (laughs) Second day of school, Mrs. Ford, typical first grade assignment, right? Draw your favorite food. All these, sorry, that's not racial at all, but all these white kids are drawing cheeseburgers and Ninja Turtles had just come out. I'm 40 years old, so you know my age. I'm not hiding anything. Ninja Turtles had come out and like, you know, they're drawing uh, pizza. We have this cool little drive-in diner in Page called RD's Drive-In. They have the best slushes and Slurpees and stuff there. So there's kids drawing that. Mrs. Ford said, do the best job you can. Put as much detail in this as you can. So these kids are all drawn away, and I'm looking at the table. I'm like, shoot, these guys, I can't draw. I'm doing good. I'm putting everything I can into this drawing. Miss Ford's coming around, giving each kid affirmations. Oh, that's a nice, that, that's a nice pizza. Oh, it's an ice cream cone. That looks really good. I like the swirls you put on there. Comes over to the Navajo kid. Sean, what is that? What is that? I'm like, what? I'm all puffy chested, super proud of my drawing, right? What is that, Sean? I hold it out. It's sheep brains. (laughs) This old white lady who was like two years away from retirement crapped her pants. She had no idea that sheep brains is a delicacy in my culture. When we butcher a sheep, nothing is wasted. And the brains are a delicacy. My grandma goes and takes the head after she cuts it off. We singe all the hair off it. We wrap it in tinfoil, dig a pit, throw it in there, cover it with a little bit of dirt, build a fire on it, and it cooks all night. The next morning for breakfast, we dig it up. Oh, man, you get that meat right there? 
good. Everybody gets after the meat, but me and grandma wait. As soon as all the meat's gone, they know nobody touches the brain until grandma gets it, and grandma's going to let Sean have the first bite. It was a delicacy. Anyways, Mrs. Ford, completely ignorant of Navajo culture, grabs me by the back of my neck, lifts me up out of the chair, and runs with me down the hallway to the principal's office. I very vividly remember looking out the windows. The library had windows about 15 feet tall. I remember thinking, my own father has never hurt me like this physically. I remember looking out those windows. It was Lakeview Elementary School. So what was out there? Lake Powell. Beautiful sight. Desert. Lake. I just remember thinking, I wish I was out there in, the, in nature rather than in school right now. This lady's punishing me for what? What did I do wrong? Get to the principal's office. Mr. Stone was the principal. Asked, what's wrong? He drew sheep brains for his favorite food. Oh, crap. Call his mom. My mom comes. What did he do? Drew sheep brains. Oh, well, what's wrong? That's his favorite food. Mr. Stone turned around and just ripped into Mrs. Ford in front of my mom. Probably to just try to save face or whatever, not get sued. <laughs> My mom took me home that day, and she didn't tell my dad what happened to me because of his experience. So the next day, I got back to Mrs. Ford's class, and because she got ripped into by the principal in front of all the staff, how do you think she treated little Sean Martin after that? Man, I couldn't do anything to get a positive affirmation in her classroom. Never said thank you. Never said good job. So in a little first grader who never gets a good job attention, positive affirmations, what kind of attention does a first grader start to seek? Negative. I became a little jerk. I was that one kid who just messed everything up to get some attention. Pick up the cubbies. It's time to clean up. I'd pull them all out and kick them all over. Somebody turn off the lights or turn on the lights. I'd go over there and flip them all off. Don't touch the fire alarm. I went over there and I pulled it. I'd hide at the playground after lunch just to stay out there and see how long I could stay out before they found that I wasn't even in class. I hated school just like my dad. and I didn't even know it. First grade. I went on and on and on and on until I got to the sixth grade. Coach Lomlin realized how good of a runner, how good of a running family my brothers and I came from. So he made sure that he brought us under his wing, and it was Coach Lomlin who looked at me on the first day of sixth grade at middle school and said, if you have one B, you will no longer compete. So from that, from that moment on, I had straight A's. Little redneck from Montana who loved us, who acted upon his beliefs, showed us that he cared about us, not like Miss Ford, he showed us he fed us. He did everything. He bought shoes for kids. He did everything he could to ensure that we were taken care of. We loved him back for it. I saw Coach Lomlin more than I saw my own dad because my dad used to get up at 5 o'clock every morning and drive 90 miles one way to go to work and 90 miles home every night to be with his family. So I only saw him for maybe an hour at night before I had to go to bed because he got me up at 5 a.m. every morning to run to the east. So Loman was much of a, as much of a father to me than, than my own dad was. So I became that one kid in class. <laughs> that was me, man. I did everything wrong because I was seeking attention just like every kid was. But when Loman came around, he gave us purpose. He showed us family outside of our families. And native kids that were coming off the res to go to school there, unfortunately, the social ills of the reservation were strong. A lot of my friends didn't have fathers. Came from broken homes. There was substance abuse. There was everything you can imagine. Loman was the one that made us run to the east, run for the right reasons. So I continued running, and that gave me an education. Everything I have that I hold sacred today is because of education and because of movement because of athletics. I met my wife 
in the sixth grade, she ran for Chin Lee and I ran for Paige. We met later in college, we got married, and began our careers and our lives together. If it wasn't for education and running, I wouldn't have a career, I wouldn't have a wife and kids, I wouldn't have a purpose to inspire change for the kids of our community and to grow our community. The Navajo Nation is beautiful, right? It's insta-famous. People know Monument Valley. People know Antelope Canyon. People know Spider Rock at Canyon de Chez. This, my original, my wife's original homestead is two miles away from this rock, a very sacred place. And we have a whole bunch of res dogs. They're like the, the stewards of the res. They're the first ones to meet you at Burger King, and they're the last ones to see you go. Feel free to take any of them that you want. <laughs> they live forever. They've been run over. They've been shot. They drink antifreeze, and they keep coming back. <laughs> Can't get rid of them. They're resilient and strong as hell. But there's a lot of negatives on the res that people don't understand. The amount of homes that our kids come from that don't have running water, electricity, the roads to get to those homes are not paved and to get there in the winter is almost impossible. How many times on a Sunday morning do you watch a football game and do you see the commercial saying for 15 cents a day you can help save these starving kids and wherever? But you know what? I can walk out my back door and throw a rock and hit a house like that. And in the year 2022, when I was a kid watching Back to the Future, I thought we were going to have self-tying shoes and hoverboards and shit. It's a third world country where I'm from. These are the conditions our kids are raised in. And unfortunately, because of the poverty and the social ills, the substance abuse. Unfortunately, our kids, even from their own families, are told, you're not good enough. You'll never leave the res. You'll never be a success. Just like my father was. It's still happening to this day. COVID only made it harder. The first thing they said when COVID hit was, wash your hands a bunch. How the hell are you going to wash your hands if you don't have running water? How are you going to do anything with a, the spread of a, to prevent the spread of a virus if you live in a house with three generations in the same little room? How are you going to wash your hands when you have to drink first? How are you going to afford hand sanitizer if you can't put gas in your truck to go buy it? Every two weeks, I drive two and a half hours just to get dro groceries. Two and a half hour trip to Flagstaff to just get groceries. You can Google it, Navajo Nation and COVID. This is the first three things. I just Googled this when I made this slide. These are the first three that came up. CNN, ABC News, Navajo Nation faces devastating loss from COVID-19. Why? Why was it such? We were uh, the world epidemic. We were the world hottest spot in the world for two and a half weeks. When it hit our people, it was devastating. There's not a student in our school system that didn't suffer a direct loss of a family member. And unfortunately, there were a lot of elders lost. Why? The population already has a pre-existing, has tons of pre-existing health issues. Diabetes, type two diabetes, hypertension, Cirrhosis of the liver, these are all effects of cultural and historical trauma that has happened to our people over generations. They turn to those substances to find healing, but it doesn't. It's only killed them. So there's a pre-existing health issue that was already there. So when COVID came, it just started taking people out that already had those issues. We have limited health care out there. Two IC units within 90 miles of my front door. Two ICU beds in 90 miles. Poverty in the community, lack of water, dense multi-generational homes, and it's a food desert. But again, you can't have all negative without some positive. 
what got us through it. Ina, the Navajo life way. In most life ways, the western map, what's at the top of a map? When you look at a map, north, south, east, and west, right? North is at the top. In our life way, the way we view things, east is at the top because that's the start of the new day. And then we go to the south, the west, and the north. The start of a new day, we begin our day with thinking. We want to think correctly. We use our corn pollen every morning. We use our corn pollen to bless ourselves. We take our corn pollen, put it in our mouth to bless our speech so we can communicate clearly every morning and bless us internally. We bless the top of our head so our thoughts are clean and pure and correct all day. And then we bless our life way from the earth to the sky. And all around. So we can live in hajan or balance. That's the Navajo life way. We think about it. We plan it. We do it. And then we reflect on it. When we're an infant. When we're a young man. When we're an older man. And when we're an elder. All of these things are brought together. Spring. Summer. Fall. Winter, everything is intertwined into this four directions. Everything is connected to this life way. And then we have the cornstalk model, where when we plant a seed in the ground, corn is sacred, it gives life, but it also is a model of that life. When we plant a seed, it's like when a baby is born. We nourish it, we water it, we feed it, we make sure nothing affects it, we make sure there's no weeds around it. We care for it. And as the, as the sprout begins to form, it's the beginning of new life. There's a female side and there's a male side to everything. I'm half female. I'm half male. I'm half my mom, half my dad. There's good, there's bad, there's male, there's female, everything. Rain. It was raining really softly a little while ago. Water is life. I believe that when it was raining just now, it was bringing life into this place, getting you ready for this competition that's coming up. It was cleansing this place, making it pure so you warriors can go into that competition and do battle. It may not be battle against your brother or sister next to you in that competition. It's battle against the demon inside your head saying it's too heavy, it's too hard, it hurts too much. You can't. It was cleansing us, getting ready for that battle. And bringing life into this. That's what the cornstalk model represents. The life is growing, both male and female together. And the fruit of that isn't just the corn that produces it, that we eat and provides nourishment to us. It's the corn pollen that connects us to everything sacred that we believe in. It is a representation of life. This medicine bundle is made of deer skin because the deer is a protector. It's a provider. This medicine bundle has corn pollen in it, which is that fruit, that blessing, that everything to us. When we make a medicine bundle like this, it has to be pure. This deer was taken without piercing its hide, meaning it wasn't shot. In the old days, we used to run the deer down and take corn pollen and suffocate it until it gave us its body. And the corn pollen goes into the animal as it inhales its last breath, blessing its spirit as it goes on into the next world. His spirit goes on and continues, leaves its body with us to nourish us and give us life. This corn pollen is sacred. So how do you view failure and success? I won't go into a lot of these details because a lot of people have already said a lot of really good things about failure and success. But basically, the Navajo view of life, there is no failure. There's only learning and progress. If you fail and you don't learn, I guess you're a failure. But if you fail at a specific task or a goal, it's not truly a failure if you learn and grow from it. The students that I work with on a daily basis are fine examples of that. 
This is my poster child. This is Antonio. Yeah, he's got Down syndrome. He was hell in the special ed class. And when the special ed teacher, Mr. Hess, had enough of him one day because he was hitting the escape button on everybody's computers, <laughs> when he pulled a fire alarm for the 10th time and evacuated the whole school, when he would purposely not wipe his butt and come to class just to get back out of class to go to the nurse's office, Mr. Hess brought him to the weight room and said, Sean, can you take Antonio just for a, just today, please? I need a break, man. I'm like, hell yeah, I was him. I'm going to work with him. I'm going to try to be his coach, Loman. So he came into my classroom, walked into the corner, and stood there for two weeks. Corner of the classroom. Nothing. Nothing. Start of every class, I'm at the doorway, ready to shake his hand and welcome the class. Nothing. He'd walk right by and go in, stand in his corner. About two weeks later, we're busting a workout out. We're just, it's a work day. It's a workout day. We're moving. We're shaking. We got circuit going. Everyone's moving. Sound is going. Music's pumping. I go to A-Train. I just started calling him A-Train because he wouldn't even give me a look, right? I go to A-Train. I'm like, hey, A-Train, do you think you could do that? And in one corner, there's guys doing pull-ups. Thumbs are in. Thumbs are in. They're not around. He's doing pull-ups. And so A-Train actually stuck his face out and goes, and that was it. He gave me the opportunity to dig. I didn't take it for granted. The next day he came to class, instead of putting my hand out to shake it, maybe he'd just give me a high five, put my hand up. Hey, A-Train, welcome to class. Put my hand up. He walks by and just pokes it. <laughs> That's the first time we had contact. It's the first time we had physical contact. He was giving me the opportunity to start establishing that relationship. Long story short, when he graduated four years later, I don't remember the exact numbers, but he was percentage-wise, based on his body, one of the strongest kids in the school. Now, he probably couldn't have passed, he, I know for sure he wouldn't have passed the Arizona assessments to receive a regular diploma, but the progress he showed from day one to the day he left my classroom was greater than any other kid in the class, any other student I ever got a chance to work with. He's the poster child of progression. A student made this poster and gave it to me, a student from A. Chain's classroom, the students were inspired by him. He became the mascot of the class. If A-Train can do it, why can't I? So a student in the art des uh, graphic design class created this. And look at this. When a student values progress and opportunity over obstacles, that was a common theme I would talk about. You got something going on at home? Let's talk about it. Because we have to take care of the student, the person, before we can educate them, right? We would talk about the obstacles at home so they could have the opportunity to learn and grow and progress. So the student made this design, and I, I love him for it. He let me have a copy, and A-Train was at the center of it. Culture, traditions, future, and community, the four sacred mountains, and A-Train right in the center. Student-centered versus teacher-centered. You've heard a lot of this already. Teacher-centered model is I'm at the middle of the room, and all my students revolve around me. I'm the master. I don't care what you're going through, you do what I say. How many of you have been lost with a teacher like that? I flipped it. I wanted to be Coach Lomlin. I wanted to put the student at the center and make sure I take into account all the stressors that every single student came to my classroom with, came to my team with, to make sure that I took care of the human first and then allowed them the opportunity to learn and grow. Brandon came to me. He had an external um, uh, insulin pump. He was 15 years old, obese, and already had an insulin pump, pumping insulin directly into his system during the regular school day. 15 years old. We're in a food desert. The only thing you can get out there to eat is processed, canned, and packaged. So by the time he was like three years old, he never even drank water. He was drinking soda. 
If you don't have water in the home, what do you drink? The only thing you buy at the store is soda. The kid had diabetes when he was 14, 15 years old and on a pump. He came to me and said, Coach, my goal is to lose this. I want to get rid of this thing. By the time he graduated, he did. Progression charts. I could spend all day talking about each one of those individuals, but we data don't lie. And when the kid progresses one little ounce, we celebrate it because they're not celebrated at home. When they walk into the classroom, walk into the weight room, we celebrate every little bit of growth. These individuals are insane. There's always a token white girl on the res. It's awesome. <laughs> These little girls came from humble backgrounds, but the one token white girl is the town doctor's daughter. But these kids, when I took over the cross-country and track program in 2004, 2005, the season at 2005, I didn't have the girls. The old, the old girls coach was still there. I only had the boys program. And they lost. We went to regionals, they lost, they didn't even qualify for state. I got the girls team the next year, understanding who they are because they're just like me, came from the same humble background. We learned how to work. They learned how to work so hard, they didn't even, I didn't even have to teach them. Res life is just hard. When I was four years old, I was learning to swing an ax. When I was five years old, I'm humping can, jerry cans of water to grandma's house. That's just a way of life. When I was eight years old, I was shooting rabbits with a 22. That's just life on the res. It's hard. I didn't have to teach the kids how to work. I just had to celebrate with them during that work. So they learned how to work and enjoy it. This is them taking it to some of the best teams in Arizona, and they're smiling. They're in an uncomfortable zone. They made the uncomfortable comfortable. When they're in their hurt zone, they're just smiling and laughing. They won regionals that season. Then we go to state and showdown against all the biggest, baddest runners in the state. One, two, three, four, five. If you know cross country, we had five in the top 12 state champions in one year simply because we celebrated, we prayed through running, we learned and we grew, and it healed us. That's my wife, assistant coach. Charnel Curley lives 45 miles away from our high school at 7,000 feet in a hogan with six siblings and both parents. Dad's always gone doing construction. Mom works as a secretary at the hospital. She would have to go home, pull a generator to start the electricity for the house, cook them a meal when they got home, put the kids to bed. She was a mom more than her own mom, never saw her dad. They'd get up at 5 a.m., get on the bus, ride it an hour and 45 minutes to school, have their breakfast. She'd come to practice after school, work her butt off, get on the activity bus home at six, get home at almost nine, have to take care of the family, put them to bed. That was her lifestyle. She was the individual champ that year. She went on to become a PE teacher and a cross-country coach. Then she went on and said, I want to serve. So she enlisted into the army, and she just got back from Korea. This young man, Kalani, you saw in the video right before. Kalani came through the weight room when I was coaching and teaching. He learned some awesome things. He went on. Now he's given back. That's the most rewarding thing I think I ever as a teacher or as a coach. It's not the amount of titles they won or, or races or individual champions they won. It's when they come back and say, thanks, coach. And so when Kalani came back and did this, this was big news. The whole Navajo Nation knew. It was front page of the Navajo Times. Look at that stuff. $80,000 in Squattober t-shirt sales. And all of that came to little old Chin Lee. Thanks to Kalani, and thanks to Bert. Thank you. <laughs> Ina, changing the circle of life one rep at a time. Because you know the circle of life, right? 
If you come from poverty, the chance of you staying in poverty is very, 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 very high. If your father's an alcoholic and runs away, chances are you're going to be an alcoholic and run away. With the help of Sorenex, we're changing that cycle for the good one rep at a time. You met Scott Trowbridge in that video. This man has done just as much for our kids that I have that then as I have. He's an amazing human being. He really wanted to be here this weekend, but he just couldn't. So going back to how do you define yourself? Do your hobbies define yourself? Do your interests define yourself? I love Harleys. Every single day when I was a kid, my dad's cousin, I just called him uncle, would get up and ride his Harley down the street. That was my notice that I had about five minutes to get to the bus stop to go to school. Always wanted a Harley. As soon as I graduated, I went to Grand Canyon Harley and got one. I love Harleys, but does it define who I am? I live a very traditional lifestyle. This is our Hogan. Live a very traditional lifestyle with my wife and two kids. But because I live in a Hogan, does that define who I am? I love to hunt. That's, that buck was taken about 300 yards out the back of our Hogan. But because I hunt, does that define who I am? I'm a runner. This was 2012 at the World 50 Mile Championships in, in San Francisco. I was eighth that day. I ran uh, six hours and seven minutes with 12,000 feet of vertical gain and 12,000 feet of vertical loss on that course, and it was raining like crazy. But does that performance that day define who I am? No. All of these things I do, I share with my students, my loved ones, because it's what I like to do, but it doesn't define who I am. In Navajo philosophy, Navajo lifeway, ina, it's what you believe in that defines you. So these are the things that I believe in. After miles and miles and miles of reflection, I believe in progress. I believe in balance. I believe in a positive outlook and embracing negatives. I believe in experiences. I believe in inspiration. I believe in endurance because life is hard. I believe in exploration, reflection and appreciation. And finally, I believe in having fun and laughing. Those are the things that define me. But they're all worthless if I don't act upon them every single day and with every action I take. So to finish today's presentation, I wanna do that with you. I challenge you. I've learned that in the world of education, if you learn something new and don't apply it within 36 hours, the chances of you applying that new knowledge goes away. If you don't apply new knowledge within 36 hours, you'll never apply it. So I challenge you to take some time to reflect upon yourself. Define what you truly believe in. What do you truly believe in? And then start acting upon it. Show people what you believe in. Just like Bert has with us in Chin Li. Show them what you believe in and act upon it. Before I finish, I want to invite Bert up here. He doesn't know it, but I had this corn pollen bag made for this trip. Because the opportunities he's affording our children and the futures he's changing are unspeakable. We don't know what the impact will have of this man's belief system and his ability to act upon it, just like we talked about. So I had this corn pollen bag made for you. So what I need you to do to make this yours is when we believe that we are receiving something, we believe that you breathe it in four times and then it becomes a part of you. So this 
My brother, it's for you. Breathe it in four times. And then, when you secure this, we're taught that you always close it without tying a boxed knot. You always leave an opening because this is a spirit. This animal is taken for spiritual purposes. It's a living thing. Its spirit is in the spirit world. Its body is with you. It contains the most sacred elements we believe in that connects you to all the things that we hold sacred. So you leave it untied without a box knot because when you box it off, it cuts off what's inside. You always leave an entryway and an outway. So that's for you. Thank you, brother. Thank you. <laughs> oh, yeah, here's a shirt. That's all I got. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Sean. You have to have questions about that. <laughs> all right, go. All right, all right. No sex. <laughs> Who has a question? Oh, Serrano. You know, I, have, I met Bert years ago. And since then, we became great friends. I used to think Bert was a badass, you know, with a bow and arrow and all that bullshit rifle, you know? <laughs> I, oh, I killed a deer here. Oh, I did this. Dude, you outrun a freaking deer and you suffocated the damn thing. Dude, Bert, you're a wuss, first of all. <laughs> 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 but, but I want to say thank you. That was an awesome lecture. I go to Phoenix, Arizona a lot. I hope to see your ass there. Take, take my info. Um, oh, trust me. I get do. it from Bert. You know, we'll hook up. You we'll come up do. to the res, man. We'll the dogs do. will welcome you. We'll have a meal. We'll go for a run. No sex, <laughs> but we'll send you off. <laughs> The uh, photo that you had up on the slide with uh, you and your classmates, were those your cheeks? Or was, or was that uh, general, uh, generic? Yeah, played the fifth. <laughs> I did pee on Miss Ford, though. Like, I figured, like, yeah. Uh, so I was in the, I, I'm an administrator at a high school. These high school kids, man, they're, they're barely figuring out the bathroom pass when they're sophomores and juniors. You know the bathroom pass. Hey, Mr. Zorn, can I go to the bathroom? Yeah, yeah, take the pass. Take the pass, you walk around, go see your girlfriend, what's up, hey, how's it going? You stay out there all day? I figured that out in the first grade. Mrs. Ford, can I go to the restroom? Go ahead. I would just stay in the restroom. Finally, Mrs. Ford would start taking me to the restroom. <laughs> Because, you know, I would just stay in there all day. So then she would start, I would stay in there. And then she started having to come into the restroom to take me out and take me back to class. She would leave the whole class unattended to take me to the restroom. Finally, I just started staying in the restroom. So then she started to start going into the restroom to get me out of there. So one day I was in the restroom at the little urinals that they have, you know. And I'm actually going pee and she's in there behind me. Sean, come on, Sean, come on, Sean, hurry up. We got to get back to class. I'm like... And then she tugged on my, my shirt, you know, let's go. And I'm like, all right, let's go. And I was midstream, peed on her ankle as she was opening, because she had to step backwards to open the door. I got her on the ankle. <laughs> yeah. Taken to the office. Mom picked me up. She didn't tell my dad about that either. Any other questions? So... Seeing the impact that the training has had and the education on these kids, 
and that being kind of their first exposure to fitness, how was that impacting down the line in the greater community as they're bringing this then to their families and maybe educating them on the importance of their health and seeing that cascade kind of happen yeah, yeah. through the community? It's an emor- enormous impact. I mean, when a kid learns about not just strength and conditioning, but learns about, about nutrition and just holistic wellness, and then what's awesome about our school and about our school district is we're a public school, right? We have all these state standards that the, the, the Board of Education has to make sure that every student in publication has to, has to learn, right? In most schools, they take these standards that you have to teach the students and they learn, they figure out how are we going to give this to these kids? Here's a standard. How are we going to, to drill this into these students? We do the opposite. We take our culture as the centerpiece and inject the curriculum around it. So we use what they know, their culture, to teach them about the standards that we have to, to teach. And so when, they're, when they learn this and they take it home, if it's a health standard, they're learning about nutrition, and then they come to the weight room, they get some success there. Then they join a team, and they're successful in any of our teams. You got Netflix? Write this down. Look up Basketball or Nothing on Netflix. It's a six-part docuseries on our basketball team. It's legit. They learn about it. They do it. They have some success. The success is celebrated. They take it home with their chest puffed out because they're excited about it. And if I can do it, mom, you can do it. Mom, let's start walking every morning. You make me run every morning anyways. Why don't you start joining me? Why don't you define your beliefs and you start acting upon it like you're making me do it? So it's, it's a regeneration of the culture. It's happening. When they're successful at, at school, they're taking it home and they're making their homes successful. And that's how you change communities. That's how you change lives. And then they're going off and getting college educated just like Kalani, giving back to the community. But then that changes Kalani's whole family's lifestyle. Now they have income. Now they can afford to to eat right. They can drive two hours to get good food and drive home. They can then send their kids to college. They can then send their kids to trade schools. They can learn what the military is truly about and truly prepare themselves to go into the military knowing what they're sacrificing, not just blindly going into directions because somebody before them said, you should be good at this, go try it, right? They're prepared, they're knowledgeable, and they, they're changing their futures, and they're changing the futures of the people around them. So I hope in 20 years when I retire, uh, when you come to Chin Lee, that it's grown so much that the culture, the people, and everything around is a, is a model of success. That's the goal. Anyone else? Serrano. <laughs> Sean, what happens to the majority of the kids that graduate from the high school? Do you keep in touch with them, number one? Number two is, what happened to the kid once he was done? You know, A train, what happened to him? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. And also, what the hell are you thinking when you're running 50 miles, dude? <laughs> well, I want to know. Yeah. So, yeah, we we definitely stay in touch with our kids. Um, I'm proud to say that our school has the largest graduating class of Native Americans in the country every year. Um, This year, a year after COVID, we didn't have many graduates last year because of the distance learning models and the lack of internet, the lack of phone lines, the lack of cellular towers. But uh, we had had 232 graduates this year, which is enormous for us. Um, So that was a big thing. We do track where they go and what they do after high school. Um, it's a small town. It's a very tight community. The culture is very interconnected on eh, or, or relationships, the clanships, right? So we always know who is where and who's doing what. I just got a text this morning from a mom. Uh, if you watch basketball or nothing, Cooper Burbank's the big star in the show. Uh, he just graduated with his associates at a two-year school in southern, in southern Arizona and uh, is signing up to go to a four-year institution for, on a basketball scholarship again. Um, a train, he graduated. Uh, he's a courtesy clerk at our grocery store in Bashes. Um, so the the store we do have a grocery store, but it's it's all processed. That's a whole other thing. But um, a train's a train's a, a courtesy clerk. 
Uh, every time I go in there, it's like, hey, Jay, it's, they bro each other up, you know, and um, he's carrying bags out, and he's still as swole as ever. Uh, he goes out there, and he collects all the carts, and he just power drives them back into the front of the store. Um, so I get to see A-Train at the grocery store, and I get to see him at all of our home events because A-Train's my boy, and my boy comes into the games for free. So, Oh, and the running thing, the 50 was just kind of, you know, well, I'll get into that later, but my, my, my greatest long adventure was a 148-mile race from Grand Junction, Colorado to Moab, Utah on the Cocopelli Trail. Um, did that one in uh, 21 hours and 27 minutes. Um, broke the course record in, by about four and a half hours, and that led to the first uh, running deal. Um, well, I was also teaching and coaching at the time, and my son was born at the time. And um, yeah, if, you, if you're into the trail running world, just Google my name. You'll see some pretty crazy stuff. Uh, the latest edition of Trail Runner Magazine, they just announced it yesterday. Uh, the Dirt Edition, it's, a, it's like an, a one, one, uh, one edition a year. Um, the very top story on there is, is uh, running in the Sacred Canyon. So it'll be coming out here pretty soon. So, yeah, if you want to go run long, let's, let's go. <laughs> That's what I love about the ultra world, though, right? Like, we're able to, to hold on to the old reasons to run, the traditional Navajo reasons to run, but I still get to compete against people. I love, love beating people. I won't be competing today, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it's always fun. All right, I'll be around. We need to get to this competition. <laughs> <laughs>